Welcome back to Joe's Live. I'm Joe Briggs. I am joined here in the studio by first congressional district candidate Bob Bestani. Bob, thanks for coming in tonight. My pleasure, Joe. What brings you to run for Congress? Why? Why? What is it in your point of your career, your background, that makes you want to uh, sure. get into this race? Well, like everybody else, I'm terribly concerned about the direction the country is going and the current state of our economy and. Uh, uh, but I find that my background is unique in that it, um, I, I, my life's experience has given me substantive, deep experience and expertise in the three issues that will dominate the national agenda, I think, in the next uh, five or ten years. I think the economy is first and foremost, uh, and that certainly includes health care as a part of it. Okay. I think the other major issue that's going to dominate uh, the national agenda is energy. Oil prices will go back up. We don't have an energy policy in the United States. And the third, certainly last but not least, uh, is national security and foreign policy, particularly as it relates to, the, uh, to Asia and the Middle East. And I've spent my life in these three issues. I know them very, very well. And, you know, I used to have a teacher who used to say, if you think knowledge and experience and expertise is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> well, ignorance is what we've tried for 30 years, and look at the mess we're in. I suggest it's about time we try somebody who knows what they're talking about in these issues. Okay, so that's a, that's a great introduction. Let's back up just a little bit. Tell me very quickly about your, 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 your background And then I want to start hitting these issues hard. Okay, great. Well, last year I retired after a 35-year career in business and finance, and when I did so, I was happy to accept an appointment as a visiting scholar at Stanford University. Uh, And I've been working on these issues. It's been a wonderful experience. uh, For the past year, I've been going back and forth to California. I told Stanford I wasn't interested in living in California, hence the visiting aspect of it. Uh, But I've been going back and forth, and that's been a wonderful experience, but a really sobering and frightening one because it's given me an upfront and very close view of what's happening in the economy and where we're heading and what's happening with our national financing, and it's terrifying. Uh So let's then then, uh, uh, take these issues. I want to go in reverse order. Okay. Um, Because I'm I'm very interested in uh, in foreign policy anyway, and uh, but on the other hand – you're running for Congress, not for senator. So let's start out with what, what's the role that a congressman plays in terms of foreign policy and trade? Well, uh, for one thing, the Congress uh, sets all the spending limits. Um, and so when we're engaged in two wars as we are in the Middle East, um, we have a foreign presence in, in, uh, around the world. So that it's, it's the House of Representatives that has to appropriate monies for not only our military but our State Department and uh, – all the branches of government have uh, affairs around the world. So the, the House of Representatives is actually intimately involved, mm-hmm. uh, just as much as the Senate is. Right. So, uh, and in particular, it's, it, you have to approve the appropriations. That's at least the way that, that, that Bush has managed this. And this well, year. The Constitution forces the, all, all spending to come out of the House of Representatives. Right, at least to be initiated by the, yes. uh, by the House of Representatives. So, <clears throat> in. 2001, we get attacked by uh, a, a known group. We've known about al-Qaeda for years. We had someone in the CIA dedicated to that, I believe Michael Shore. And uh, instead of – I guess Bush had the option of doing two things, treat that as a police action, someone committed a crime, we're going to go get them, or go to war. We went to war. Did you agree with that pivotal, pivotal decision? Was it worth going to war in Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, it made sense. Did it? We took our eye off the ball, though. We went into Iraq. I could tell you, Joe, you know, when uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield uh, mm-hmm. w- were in place uh, back in uh, 1990, 91, yeah. I was at the U.S. Treasury Department. I was serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary um, uh, during the first Bush administration. Um, and I loved my job there. But I I was so dedicated, I was so convinced that that was the right war that I almost volunteered to uh, to join the Defense Department and go to that. I didn't for family reasons, but I, I was this close to doing it. The second Iraq invasion, I was so dead set against it. My wife was telling me, Bob, you've got to stop yelling at the TV. They can't hear you. 
it was completely the wrong policy. Anybody who knew anything about the Middle East tell, would tell you that Iraq had nothing to do with it. I personally spoke with Brent Scrocroft, who you may remember. Yeah, he, he opposed it. Right he on. was a four-star general, two-time national security advisor, and the best friend of the old, uh, the first President Bush, the father. Mm-hmm. Right. And he, he, he all but threw his body in front of the train that you know was going on this right. uh, in, in, into Iraq. I was dead set against it. And I think that that was a huge serious mistake for the United States, and we took our eye off the ball, which was Afghanistan. As Afghanistan makes some sense. We need, we should have spent a lot more attention on it. Having said that, though, I don't think that we now, we, we've now finally ramped up. We've got 68,000 uh, troops in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, we've, but for a while we had about 10,000. It, it just made no sense. Mm-hmm. But I don't see throwing in another 40,000 um, uh, troops into there because I think it's going to continue to escalate. You know, I, I was just uh, having a meeting with a former Green Beret in Vietnam, and he and I were in total agreement on this. We're both hearing echoes of Vietnam in this. We cannot be completely ramping that up. So we need a presence there, largely because of Pakistan. We should not be going overboard with, uh, with Afghanistan. So, so let me back up just a little bit. It, it, there was another pivotal decision, whether, whether whether or not you agreed with going into Iraq. There was an important decision. At one point, we pulled him out of the spider hole, and weapons inspector Charles Dalfour went over there and said, it's clean, nothing here. Yes. And we had the decision of leaving or staying. That's right. And occupying. What about that decision? Well, like Were, Colin, were we already pot committed at that point? We were already committed. Colin Powell said it very eloquently. Yeah. You're in a pottery shop, you break the pot, you own it. Yeah. We, we're, brought, we're, we, we broke Iraq. Was it broken at that point? Because I thought that actually that was a point where we could have – Gone out with some face. We so well, be, but we so mismanaged. Because Iraq. I've heard several times, read several books, which would say, you know, we actually did win the hearts and minds through the invasion, but by December of two thousand four with sure. Haditha, we lost it. Well, we we dismantled the army. We threw all the Baths regime out of uh, out of power. And you're talking about J. Paul or uh, Bremer. Bremer. Uh, I mean, he just completely screwed it up with the support of, of uh, Rumsfeld and the White House. I mean, it was a disaster. Right. Uh, so, and, and, you know, it, it's funny because I was talking to Secretary Baker uh, about a year and a half ago about this. Yeah. And, um, in, and we were talking about the Iraq, the first Iraq war. Because he, he created a, a plan. He to created kind of a plan. And, and, and they got they – but they, you, you'll recall, Joe, they were completely criticized again and again and again for not going into Baghdad and finishing the job. And what Secretary Baker said to me was, uh, you know, I don't get that question anymore. Yeah. And it's obvious why. They knew what was going to happen. If they had gone into Baghdad, seized Baghdad, they would have, been, they would have owned it. Okay. So let's, 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 let's move across the pond there in Afghanistan. Help me out with something. How would we know when we win that? At what point do we know that, our, that, that we got their flag or, or that we've won? What is it to win in Afghanistan? Well, that's the open question. There is no winning in Afghanistan. You, 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 you've basically got to make sure that to the maximum extent possible, and that's a very hard uh, criteria, but to the extent possible, you've got to keep al-Qaeda out of there. You can't let them have a safe haven. You've got to try to keep the Taliban out there, uh, particularly Do around— Do you separate those two? Because um, it was my understanding at the time of 9-11, yeah. the, the wildest estimates on the number of people— in the Taliban, I mean, in, in, in al-Qaeda, was in the hundreds. And- I, I've heard much higher numbers um, of uh, al-Qaeda, um, and, and, and numbers vary. I mean, no one I mean, no one's ever done a census of al-Qaeda. You'll, you'll never get it. Um, I think there was a huge overlap between the two. I don't think they were completely overlapped. Uh, I think they're two very different functions. If you look at the Taliban, for instance, people say that uh, only 20% of the Taliban are really hardcore, and probably uh, 60 or 70% of of the uh, the all the Taliban are, are guys trying to get a job. You know, they're handed an AK-47, told you know go shoot and you know guard this particular area and whatnot. So it, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. But there is an overlap. There are some real extremists. I mean, the Taliban by definition are extreme. But uh, the Taliban were not reaching out to try to attack the United States. Are, 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 they, are, 
is the Taliban extreme or are they conservative? Oh, they're extremely conservative. Put it that way. I mean, uh, before Al Qaeda got to Afghanistan, the kind of things that they were perpetrating in Afghanistan to the public was just terrible. Uh, you know, I, I've been at the stadium where they were beheading people by the scores. Uh, it's it's a very nasty place. That regime was under Sheikh Mohammed uh, is, is, uh, Omar. Is, is that the business of taxpayers in Manchester to rectify that? No, exactly not. Um, we, we need to the extent possible make sure that Al Qaeda does not have a safe haven. But you can't, you know, you, you can't safeguard all of Afghanistan. It's, it's physically impossible. So, so, so you made the point earlier that, that we should continue on. You're not saying we should just get the heck out of Afghanistan, even though you, you couldn't articulate when, you know, what the, the objective is to say that we've won. You're you're not saying that we should pull out, we should stay, but I'm not understanding why it is that we should stay and what we should stay for. Because the key to that region is is uh, partially Afghanistan, but it's also Pakistan. It's the back door to Pakistan. Pakistan is everybody's foreign policy nightmare. It has all of the problems you could imagine. It's It starts with terrorism. It starts with ethnic strife. It's got instability in the country. It's got a dysfunctional government, and it's got nuclear weapons on but, but, top of that. But how would you compare its stability today with its stability in August of 2001? It's much less stable now. Right. So, much so, less stable now. It, it, you had Musharraf, who was the president at that point. At least you had the military controlling things now. It was weakening. The, 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 the sands were dropping under uh, Musharraf's government slowly but surely. But if you compare just that time frame to with this time frame, it was much more stable under Musharraf. What, what do you think was you know, about the impact of his firing or dismissing the Supreme Court justice? I mean, because there, there it was on the, on, the front, on The Economist, photographs yeah. of a riots in the streets of, of, uh, of, of, of Lahore. Yeah. And the people doing the writing were a bunch of lawyers in suit and ties. It, it was a disaster. It was yeah. a complete disaster for the government. But military governments never last very long because, they, you know, they, they can hold on to power only if they, you know, yeah. exercising draconian power. Right. Uh, and Musharraf didn't want to take it that far. Yeah. And so he, he left, fortunately. Uh, but and, and people, I mean, middle class people really wanted Musharraf yeah. out. But I think they sort of miss him in a way at this point. Right. Uh, we're going to take a phone call here. Jerry, welcome to the program. We have uh, Bob Bisto. Oh, it's Jeff. I'm sorry. Jeff, welcome to the program. Yes, I'd just like to ask uh, uh, your guest the question. He's running for uh, the, the House seat in New Hampshire. Right. Bob Bistani is running. The main priorities he had was um, uh, the economic uh, slump that we're in. Sure. And uh, to divert you away from the Afghanistan thing, uh, you know, obviously uh, it's a problem. It's expensive, and it does that impact uh, uh, our, our debt loads in the United States. What is his plan, and what would he promote to uh, pull the United States out of this slump? What, uh, what would he favor, and how would his plan differ from what uh, is going forward now? Thanks, Jeff. Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think that basically the, uh, the efforts that the administration have put in place are really misguided. Uh, the so-called stimulus plan is is really it, it it is doing nothing for the economy. You know, 77 percent of the stimulus plan doesn't trigger until next year. I think only about 15 percent of it has been spent at this point. Um, and so I think we need to roll that back because basically what we're doing is committing for obligations where we have to spend money that we have to borrow from abroad. And the problem of all of this is that it is weakening the dollar. The world is awash with dollars at this point. You know, 75% of all the dollars that circulate in, uh, around the world circulate abroad. And the world is beginning to signal to us that it doesn't want any more dollars. The Chinese are, are, are clearly signaling this. The Indians, you know, just sold back uh, or bought back uh, several billion dollars worth of gold and shipped it off to India for safekeeping. Um, and we're seeing the, the, the dollar buckle. If the dollar gets weaker and weaker, which it show, is showing sign, uh, signs of doing, then this has a real potential for really disrupting the economy. Because if the world isn't willing to buy treasury bills, notes, and bonds, uh, the treasury is, still has to fund that obligation. So interest rates will start rising. And everything keys off of the treasury rates. 
So if treasury rates start rising, mortgage rates will start rising, business loans will start rising, uh, and it will wash across the economy and put the brakes on it. So we've got to be very careful about this excess spending that we're doing. Same time, the Federal Reserve has been flooding the markets with money, uh, which is all borrowed at the same time. You know that Washington's committed over $13 trillion dollars to this recession at this point, and I think much of it is misguided. So I think we've got to roll those back. But in addition to that, we've got to basically focus in on the regulatory apparatus, which is overseeing the the financial system. We've got a mess in Washington. We've got seven or eight financial agencies that are all charged with regulating different parts of the financial markets, and they're all in competition with each other. They hate each other. They don't talk to each other. In fact, they're, they're suing each other. The F- CFTC and the SEC are, are, are suing each other mm-hmm. as to who has jurisdiction over uh, derivatives. It's a complete mess. Yeah. And, and, and the financial institutions uh, are basically playing one off against the other. Does, does the American taxpayer have the right to know who AIG has made whole with U.S. tax dollars, with, with, with TARP tax dollars. Considering the billions of dollars in there, you bet we do. Because I'm trying to understand here. Our, our, our Senator Judd Gregg says, no, we do not. I, and, di- I and, differ with him. Okay. And, and make, make, make the case. I mean, cause, uh, my concern is, you know, a, a lot of that money that, 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 that AIG was exposed to, that, that they insured, was from sovereign funds. Sovereign funds made wealthy on oil that we paid for. Sure. And, and that whose cost elevated because of the wars in many ways that, that you, could, you could argue that, that we cost. So it's like we're paying for this three times. I mean, but if it's a sovereign fund, aren't those guys big boys? Do, 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 does some guy in Manchester really responsible to a fund out of Norway or Saudi Arabia that was very well researched and, and you know, knew what they were doing before they went into it? These are so-called institutional investors. Yeah. Institutional investors are supposed to be knowledgeable and smart and, uh, and, and on top of the risks that they um, uh, undertake when they invest in, 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 uh, in private companies. There is absolutely no way that the United States government should have been bailing them out. And you see Secretary Geithner, the Treasury, who actually used to work for me, uh, you see him coming under enormous criticism – for the um, for for uh, basically um, leaving a lot of money on the table. Are, are you saying that AIG? AIG was not too big to fail? Should have been allowed to fail, or I I, I think it would have been terribly disruptive if the whole thing went down in in a, in a, in a giant collapse. Uh, I think the government is wise to act as a shock absorber to let it down so that it didn't disrupt the entire financial markets. But we should not have been bailing them out. And making sure and keeping uh, investors whole, we should have allowed uh, investors, both equity investors and bondholders, to take a hit on 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 that. We didn't do that, and I think that that's a, a big part of the problem that we have now. And I say this having spent 35 years of my career in the financial markets. Do you like Frank Ginta? Frank's a nice enough guy. Have you met him? Sure. Uh, did he try to talk you out of running? No. Um, did you call him and tell him you wanted to run? Uh, actually, I started running well before he did. I started in January of last year, so he jumped in in May. So you He had, knew I was in the market. So you had already made some sort of an announcement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I announced in January. And how did you announce? Uh, press release and uh, talked to the press and uh, did everything I could to uh, make sure that uh, – uh, people knew I was in the race. Uh, you know what? If you're running uh, in in the first congressional district or even the second grid, in, anywhere in New Hampshire, uh, unless you've held statewide office, the biggest challenge you have is name recognition. Um, so I'm reasonably well known in the Seacoast area. Frank is reasonably well known in Manchester area, but Frank isn't known, you know, in the rest of the district. And uh, you know that's the biggest challenge. Um, does, and, does Carol Shea <coughs> Porter give you hope? Uh, what kind of hope? Well, nobody Hopefully knew her, and nobody ever heard of her from the, from uh, in Manchester. It was a Jim Craig was the anointed one. Yeah. Frank Ginter is the anointed one. No, he isn't way. actually. Well, I think he's the anointed one. He isn't. Well, uh, does that does Carol Shea Porter give you hope? Because the Seacoast obviously has some huge sway because they pulled it out for her. I trust in the uh, good people of New Hampshire. And do you plan on 
Let me let me ask you from a strategy point of view. We got a lot of people watching right now. A lot of Frank Ginter guys watching you right sure. now. So uh, a lot of people who are either happy with Frank Ginter or not happy with Frank Ginter. What are you hearing about um, his style of management? What he's done? He's kept taxes low. What, what are you hearing out there? Look, uh, you know, Frank Ginter has his campaign to run. I have mine. That's a uh, good I, I polished would answer. Prefer not to comment on on Frank. Uh, you know, the 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 voters of uh, Manchester know Frank much better than I do. Uh, they've formed an opinion about Frank. Uh, there's, there's nothing for me to add or detract from that. They know exactly who he is. Well, Should- what, what do you dif- what do you differ from him? I mean, so you, you, you the guys come out. He's never lost an election. Neither have like, I. Actually, you ever went run for one? Sure. I've run for numerous offices. I've been, you know, I've been involved in in politics uh, really since I was a kid. Um, I've, I've, you know, at every level. In in high school, I was in student government. In college, I was head of student government. In my junior year, I've been involved in Republican politics since I was 17. Um, Growing, uh, when my kids were in school, I've run for uh, school boards uh, again and again. Okay, so you were on a school board. School board. In what town? uh, In Tenafly, uh, in in a town called Tenafly. But I've also been on municipal towns uh, and uh, in, uh, in in Seacoast uh, in Newmarket. Uh, I ran for uh, election, uh, let's say, the Budget Committee. I've, I was chairman of the Energy Committee, ch- chairman of the Audit Committee. Uh, I'm on the Rockingham County Executive Committee. So I've been involved in politics for a very long time. I've worked for innumerable candidates over the course of my life. I've run for office numerous times. I've never lost an election. So I'm not new to this. You know, I served at a very senior level in the United States government. I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. At a, at a rank level, that's the equivalent of a three-star general when I was 40. So, I, you know, if, if you ask who's held the highest position in government in, in all of these, um, uh, you know, of all of the candidates, is by no question that I've had the highest government uh, position of any of the candidates. And... Most of my career has been in the private sector. I've sort of set roughly 30 uh, out of 35 years in, in the private sector, well, let me, in all let me, aspects of the let private me, sector. Uh, let me ask you then a tough question. Uh, do you think that the United States military, the United States, uh, the United States, my son, uh, should be defending West Bank settlements? No. I think we need to. Um, I, I think we need to manage that situation. It's almost insoluble, and the tragedy is that you know we, um, the, the the Israelis and the Palestinians need a two-state solution there. That's the only way to do it. But unfortunately, because of the settlements that have occurred on the West Bank, you now have about three hundred and fifty thousand Jewish settlers in that area. And there is no getting them back. You know, uh, Sharon tried to go in and remove a dozen of them, and it split the military. It, it was a disaster. And Sharon was one of the biggest supporters of, of settlements for a very long time. But when he tried to take a dozen people out of there, you had near chaos there. The problem is we have probably moved beyond a two-state solution. And here's the dilemma for Israel. And I worry about Israel's, uh, you know, uh, uh, survival, and not so much survival, but I worry about uh, the political situation there in the future because you're not going to be able to get a two-state solution at this point. You're at least talking about a three-state solution. Uh, and here's the problem. The Muslims are multiplying much faster than the Israelis. What happens in 10 or 15 years when the, when the Muslims far outnumber the Israelis in Israel? Do they go to uh, a system where it's going to be one man, one vote? Do they go to an apartheid system? Do they try to show the, 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 the Palestinians Well, they're an apartheid the door? system now. When you say there's a problem, when you say um, there, the problem is that more Muslims will be coming, do you mean that as a problem – um, for the Israelis, or do you think that's a problem for the negotiation process? Or it's it's, it's a, a problem. problem. For everybody, no, it's it's, and a it's, it's not. For, it's not Muslims. It's the, it's the non-Jewish population, the the, the native uh, Arabic, and and the, the I mean, the, it's it's the non-Jewish population, mostly the Palestinians who are who, of, who not all it, are Muslims. It is the Palestinians. I mean, right. that, it, it's a problem between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And here's right. the problem: uh, Israel is a Jewish state. But you've got it. What happens when the majority of the population is no longer Jewish? If it's Muslim, well, that, that, that 
that, that would no longer be democratic, then would it? Well, exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the existential problem that Israel faces. The settlers will not leave the West Bank. But if you go to Tel Aviv and sit down at any cafe and talk to whoever's sitting next to you and ask them about it, they say, yeah, we got a really serious problem. Have you been there? I have not, but I've talked to innumerable people. Let's, let's take a question here from Jerry. Jerry, welcome to the program. You're on with Bob Bastani. Yeah, how you doing? Good. Uh, Mr. Bastani, I, I believe I first saw you on the Jeff Bradley show. Yeah, I was here in this studio. And uh, I was very impressed with your knowledge. Well, thank you. And your approach to problems. And um, I was so impressed, I wrote your name down in my notebook. Whoa. How do I get in that notebook? At least one vote. <laughs> you got at least one vote. Well, thank you. I appreciate right. it. Do you, have, do you have a question, Jerry? Was that your – that was it. Uh, let, me, let me ask another quick question. I'm on the school board, and we've been level-funded for the last couple of years, but yet because of the rising cost of health care on a level funding, we lost – 20 teachers in Manchester sure. this year sure. because health care went up a million dollars. Sure. 20 teachers. How do we deal with that? Well, we, there's no question that in the United States we need reform in medical care. The, the, first of all, if, if you look, uh, compare us to any country in the, in the world, we're about twice as expensive as any other country. And yet the, uh, uh, we're not getting quality for, for, for money. And health care is now uh, reaching proportions where it, it is growing so fast it is getting out of the reach of the middle class. It, it really is a disaster. And it also affects jobs because if you look at the average car that comes off the, uh, the, the assembly line in, in Detroit, uh, you've got um, $2,000 worth of medical expenses built into that car that a comparable Japanese car does it. So it, it's hurting us across the board. But the problem is that the bill and the proposals that are coming out of the Congress right now don't deal with the issue. And if you notice the, uh, the rhetoric that Obama had, when he started this whole process, he was talking about getting the costs down. He doesn't talk about getting the costs down. He's now talking about the insurance aspect because the bills that are, are currently in front of Congress don't touch the core problem. They're putting the cart in front of the horse. Uh, they're dealing with the insurance, which is merely the payment mechanism for insurance as opposed to why are costs going up in our system as fast as they are? Why are they as high as they are? It doesn't deal with the frivolous lawsuits, which tort reform uh, would touch. It doesn't deal with um, the incentive structure for doctors who are incented to give you more and more tests. It doesn't deal with well, uh, wellness in the whole system. We treat symptoms as opposed to, you know, uh, what is the, the sort of trajectory of a person's health. It doesn't deal with end-of-life expenses. It, it doesn't deal with a lot of things. But that, it's just that, an ad hoc. That's the conflict. You, you, have, you have conservatives who will accuse the liberals of wanting something that will let grandma die and, and, and yet refuse to deal with tort reform. The liberals, on the other hand, saying, you know, look, 90 percent of, of, of health care dollars is spent in the last six months of life. You've got to really get real with that. Sure. And, you know, they want to make sure that, that, that you have some protections in the event that there's, you know, there's malpractice. Sure. How do, how do, you, how do you bridge those two? It's tough. It's, it's really tough. And you know what? Not one country in the world has done it right. We keep hearing comparisons between ourselves and Japan and France and Switzerland. Not one country in the world has done it. It's a very, very tough issue. But this bill doesn't begin to address it. What it's doing is it's creating an entitlement f with monies that we don't have. You know, I tell people this all the time. We, this is not a rhetorical statement. This is not an exaggeration. America is on the road to bankruptcy. It is, in 10 or 15 years, we are going to see, if we stay on this road, we are going to see America begin to default on its obligations, on Social Security, on Medicare, on Medicaid, just like California is now defaulting on its obligations. You know, there's that old saying, how California goes, so goes the rest of the country. Well, we're, you know, it's on the horizon. And if we continue to add cost after cost after cost, we're just accelerating the process. Let me what, ask you, if you uh, – an immediate savings of what uh, maybe – they're estimated at a million dollars per troop if the expands the amount of troops that are going to go to Afghanistan. Is it time to shut down our borders and say, listen, we need to 
pay our own bills for a while to the rest of the world and, and close up shop and, and, and get our house in order? Or is there a way that you can do those types of things um, and still be the servant to the rest of the, the world? Well, it, it, it's, it, we're not being altruistic towards the rest of the world, uh, not totally anyway. Uh, our interests are global. The United States is, it has interests in every corner of the world. We have people you know, from every corner of the world. Uh, we have ties there. Political uh, necessities require our being there. Uh, but we've got to be, I think, a lot more studied about the, you know, which problems we address and which we don't. We can't be going around the world as we have been for the last 75 years. We've got to taper it back a, a, a bit. What's the last book you read? Oh, they asked that to Palin, and then she got crucified, so you better be careful. <laughs> My God. Uh, I read a book on Bernanke and the Federal Reserve. Well, did, you, was, was it, did you learn anything insightful, or was it? Uh... Uh, no, it was, uh, I mean, it was a good review of, of the Federal Reserve. You know, I've had a lot of dealings with the Federal Reserve. When I was yeah. Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, uh, I was, uh, it, it, w one of the largest parts of my job was international monetary policy. And so I would have lunch every Wednesday. Uh, with the Fed governors, and so I got to learn a lot about the Treasury, and it was very interesting to uh, to um, basically take a review, see what Bernanke's approach has been. Um, and is he uh, doing a good job, or is he spending us into Bolivia? I mean, he he's a a student of the de of the depression, and he believes that we need to spend our way out of it. If we did not spend the money that we spent so far, we would be in such a hole. We it would take us a lot longer to get out. He's got a philosophy. Do you agree with that philosophy? Um, not totally. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it is the conventional approach uh, to a recession. Um, you know, there have always been, well, in, in, since the Second World War, there have been two schools of thought about the economy, the, the fiscal, you know, the Keynesians and the monetarists. I studied under Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I went there because I, I started off as a Keynesian because that's what you, you know, when you learn economics in college, that's, you know, they give you Samuelson's book and, and you start off as a Keynesian. Trickle and, down and, economics, right? Uh, well, supply side. that's, supply side. yeah. Well, no, not even supply side. Uh, that was, I mean, supply Supply side was Art Laffer, and that was a very bizarre, um, you know, branch of economics at the university. He, he I, actually, I took two courses from Art Laffer at the University of Chicago, and he was very, very controversial. In fact, I was in a room once where uh, an undergraduate said uh, to Mr. Friedman, uh, or Professor Friedman, he said, uh, "So Art Laffer says." And uh, Professor Friedman said, next question. Um, and in fact, Art Laffer was thrown out of the University of Chicago for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which is he lied about his dissertation. Uh, so he was fired from the University of Chicago. But, but that, that's off the point. Yeah. Uh, you know, I started off as a Keynesian because that's what I learned, but I was very interested in monetary theory. It, what we've had now is uh, basically a huge ramp up of both fiscal policy and monetary policy to attack this. And my contention is, and I've been saying this for years now, is we didn't need that stimulus. We didn't need, uh, you know, the 12 trillion, or it's actually now almost 14 trillion dollars of money that they have thrown at this. This recession is not the classic recession of a supply-demand imbalance that, you know, you need to, you know, just perk the economy up a little bit. The, 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 um, this recession has been a structural recession that is related to an overstimulus of the economy. Uh, you know, I've been, my campaign really started off a lecture that I gave about understanding the current economic crisis, and I've probably had about 20 town hall meetings all over the state. To, to help educate people on what this economic crisis is all about. I did one yeah. in Derry yesterday. Uh, I have another request to do it again in a month. Your, 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 your philosophy, your line of reasoning sounds, uh, I might be wrong, sounds a little bit more like uh, kind of the, the Austrian economist, the, the, the Ludwig von Mises yeah. type of, yeah. uh, of, of background where we should have, the, the problem that we have right now is for interfering and not allowing the market to correct itself. It needed to crash in a sense. I, I don't say it needed to crash. You know, the government, as I said earlier, can act as a shock absorber. And I think that that's very important because it's people's lives that you're talking about. And you don't want them to hit the wall. You need the government to go in there and, and absorb some of the shock and, and, and let it out. But the things that we have undertaken, both under Bush and under Obama, I have serious problems right. with. 
Jeff, welcome to the program. You have a question for Bob Bastani? I realize I'm only supposed to have one question, on, but this candidate is so fascinating to me. Well, thank I you. just had to ask him uh, a question. We, he began to actually get into some of the content about 60 seconds ago. But I, I've heard him criticize uh, the Democratic, the Obama approach to the economic problems. Now I, uh, I, I'm interested in how much he blames Republican policy uh, for uh, some of the economic uh, difficulties we're in now, this uh, you know, tragic uh, crash of, uh, of the stock markets, of the investment banks, of major banking institutions like Citigroup and Bank of America. By the way, the AIG number is $180 billion, yeah. and Goldman Sachs uh, was a big beneficiary of that, along with some of the other investment houses, sure. some of which did not survive. So how much is Republican oversight over the last eight years responsible for this mess, and should we be blaming uh, Obama uh, now, as uh, so much of talk radio does? I'll, I'll hang up. No, I think, I think you raise a very good point. Uh, quite honestly, I'm critical of the, the, uh, the financial policies of the last 30 years under both Democrats and Republicans alike. Because we've, we, you know, we're, the American economy is like uh, uh, an Olympic gold medalist, fantastic athlete. But our economy has been allowed to pick up some really bad habits. Uh, we have been consuming too much. We have not been saving enough. God knows we are not manufacturing enough. And yet we have not wanted to, uh, you know, pull back our lifestyles. And so what we've been doing is printing dollars to buy goods and services from abroad. And if you look at the trend, the dollar has been declining almost steadily for the last 40 years or so. It has been getting progressively weaker and weaker and weaker. And the world is now very worried about this. Is that a bad thing? I mean, it makes our, our, our products more competitive. I mean, we don't make anything anymore, probably because our dollar is so high and well, health insurance costs are so well, much adding to the Well, you, you the just value. contradicted yourself. You said uh, that it's getting weaker. Is that a bad thing? And the dollar is so high. You're, I mean, it you're was. Right. In the past, it was so high. And look at so, how strong the U.S. economy was at that time. Now, uh, it's true that a weaker dollar uh, encourages exports. But what it does is it also discourages capital inflows into the United States. And you have to look at both of them. Because we were the beneficiary of tremendous investment monies that were coming into but, but, the United but, but States. But isn't, isn't, isn't it better to have your capital inflow in, in the form of someone buying your product as opposed to investment? Um, well, if, if, if foreign companies are willing to create plants in the United States that create jobs... That's very healthy. I mean, look at, look at for instance, okay, the auto industry, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, it's, it's not plans. a well, I mean, it's, it's kind of a lost um, notion, but the United States produces some of the best cars in the world. We just don't do it in Detroit. We do it in the South, where you go, you go to South Carolina, you go to Kentucky, you go to, um, you know, a variety of states, Alabama there, and you've, you've got some of the best cars in the world being produced. They just happen to have stickers on them that say Toyota and BMW and Nissan and, you know, a whole variety of other things. So investment in the United States is very, very good, and, and we should be encouraging it. There is no – I can tell you, I, when I was at the U.S. Treasury, I handled uh, dollar policy, and I advised the secretary on, on dollar, and, and there's a pattern. No secretary of state is allowed to say anything but we believe in a strong dollar. That's all he's allowed to say. If he's asked questions, he says, we believe in a strong dollar. And I saw Tim Geithner do the same thing at the same time yesterday. Uh, it's critically important. So it, it, it is very helpful for the United States to have a strong dollar. But we've been borrowing so much from abroad and abusing the privilege that only America has in this world of printing money and as a result, you know, we've just flooded the world with dollars and uh, the markets are saying, hey, you know, we're getting to the edge here. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, welcome to the program. You have a question for Bob Bistani? Hey, how you doing tonight, guys? Good, good. thanks. Uh, good to see the show. I always like tuning in. Uh, this is a pretty interesting guest, definitely. Thank and you. I had a question for Bob. I was wondering, you know, you said you spent a lot of time looking at uh, – trying to understand the Federal Reserve and, and all that all that good stuff. Um, I was wondering if they had ever talked to you 
I would imagine if you're meeting with the Board of Governors that they were to talk to you about how it was a private bank and how it wasn't regulated by Congress and this, that, and the other thing. But I was wondering, it, it, when, you look, when you look at the problem of the economy, do you, do you not see a fundamental flaw in the idea that we're allowing a private bank to issue the currency? And if you do see that as a flaw, I was wondering, what do you, what do you think we do about it? I mean, do we, do we nationalize the Federal Reserve, or do we somehow allow the Congress to regulate the money and printing of it? I don't know. I was just wondering what you thought we could do about the Federal Reserve. Thanks, Ryan. Well, the, the, the Federal Reserve uh, is essentially a creature of con uh, Congress. It reports to the U.S. Congress, and it has to be audited by the Congress. There's a lot of rhetoric about that right now. But it is the Congress that oversees the Federal Reserve. Uh, but the Federal Reserve, in the final analysis, is uh, the central bank of the United States, and every country in the world has a central bank. And it doesn't really matter if it's that central bank or any financial institution. You know, Hong Kong, uh, the, the money of Hong Kong uh, for a very long time was issued by the Hong Kong Shanghai, a private bank. Now, we've never gone to that extreme, um, at least not since colonial times. Uh, but it, it really doesn't matter. As long as the currency is sound and, and well-controlled and uh, it, it prudently managed, it, it almost doesn't matter. So, so you and Ron Paul don't hang out at the same parties? I, I, look, I, there's a huge libertarian streak in yeah. me, you know. Uh, but I, you know, I, 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 I've always said, you know, if two people uh, agree more than 90% of the time, one of them isn't thinking. So, you know, while I like a lot of what Ron Paul says, um, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, I agree with everything. But, but at says. minimum, should, 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 the, uh, should the Fed be accountable? Of course. Should, should, should Congress have access to its budget, to its expenditures, to, to what it does? Yes, and it already does. Does it? Yes, absolutely. Let's go back to the question that Jeff, uh, Jeff called and that Jeff Cassell called and asked about. He said – all right, he asked you whether you, the Republicans are to blame for the last eight years under the Bush administration for where we are today. And if they are fine, should we not yet be criticizing Obama for his policies? And I, and I, I would say – I would take that to the next level and say Geithner was part of the Bush hierarchy, whether he was one of his top guys or not. He was down below Bernanke. He was working in the background. Uh, his, so he's the one that gets to come to the top now. Yeah, he was head of he, the Federal Reserve in New York. Okay, so all right, well he was right. So he was where the money plays uh, and the big boys play. Now he's the top chef, and he's the guy who's in the uh, Obama administration. And, and and I don't want to detract from what I'm trying to say, but I think what we're is is Geithner doing the right things? Is he still following the same policies, or is he making mistakes that are? making the criticism of Obama legitimate? Or is there no legitimate – are we not Are we not legitimately criticizing – are we Are we not – are we criticizing Obama unfairly at this point? It was it been almost – it hasn't been a year yet. Oh, it's been a year. Uh, uh, well, since he was January. elected, yeah, yeah. In January. Right. He'll be in. Uh, look, I, I, I take issue with a number of things that the Obama administration is doing. I think the stimulus package was wrong. You the know, first I, one I, or the second one? Both of them. Well, I, both of them. Okay. I mean, the way they were handled uh, was completely wrong. I made the argument, and I've, I've written this in my website. By the way, uh, if your viewers would like to look at my website, it's very easy to find. It's uh, bobbestani.com. Bestani is spelled B-E-S-T-A-N-I. And you can find numerous articles I've written on these subjects uh, on my website. So, Well, it, as a matter know, of fact, so. our, our viewers have, our people are chatting with us live and uh, some of them have Good. already said Good. that there's a lot of meat to it and so forth. It's a great website. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was critical of the, the stimulus package. I, say, I wrote an article in there basically saying that if, you, if for political reasons you had to look like you were doing something, which is certainly true. I think there'd be riots in, in Washington if the government was not doing something. So I understand the political motivation for doing something. But if you had to do something, you should have put it in infrastructure because God knows our infrastructure is in disastrous shape. You know, last year, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave America a D for the quality of our infrastructure. We think of American infrastructure, infrastructure as the best in the world, our roads, our ports, our airports. We got a D. We require $2.6 trillion of it. Do you know how much of this stimulus package goes to the infrastructure? 16%. Here in New Hampshire, 
We have 77 bridges that are redlined by the New Hampshire Department of Trans, uh, Transportation as in need of repair. They're critically, I mean, redlined as critically in a, it costs $450 million. We have nowhere near that for this. We got roads that need, uh, you, you know, I drive up in the North Country, I can tell you, we are, you know, the, the snow heaves from last year haven't been fixed. Yeah. So uh, President Eisenhower said that our roads and our infrastructure are an inherent part of national security. Absolutely. You know, we're spending $200 billion a year in Afghanistan and Iraq. Should more of that be spent on infrastructure, as you're saying, as a part of security? Well, I mean, but no, but if you look at the stimulus packet, it was $787 billion, not to mention the side deals that were cut to get it passed, okay? And only 16% of that goes into infrastructure. We should have been doing a lot more. And the Chinese, in fact, yeah. have been doing that. Economists are an argumentative bunch. Uh, they barely get a you know uh, agree with each other ever. But one thing that economists are almost unanimous about, and that is that infrastructure gives you the biggest bang for the buck. So we need it anyway. Spend it there. Yeah. Instead, we, we 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 spent on pig odor research, honeybee insurance, ATV trails, cars for bureaucrats, and a whole slew let's, of let's other. Let's talk dumb energy things. and energy independence for sure. a moment. What's the role that nuclear power plant nuclear power plays in that? Nuclear power has to play a big role in America's future. You know, um, let, me, let me criticize the Republicans uh, for a second. Last year at the Republican convention... Well, the, let me put on my Ray Buckley hat. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, both parties have, you know, have, have things to criticize, you know. And, and look, uh, you know, I just want what works. I don't care who comes up with it, okay? As long as it works, that's w really what I want. Um, but, but I can tell you... That, you know, the mantra at the Republican uh, uh, um, convention last year of drill, baby, drill, that was cute, but that's not an energy strategy. America desperately needs an energy strategy. We've been talking about it for 30 years, and we still don't have anything. Do you know that America imports about $800 billion a year in oil mm -hmm. from OPEC? And we borrow from the likes of the Saudis and the Chinese to pay for it. If that's not a recipe for disaster, I don't know what is. So we need an energy strategy in the United States, and we don't have one. An energy strategy in the United States would um, require at least a, a short, medium, and long-term approach. Short term, we need conservation. And we could do a lot more with a lot less if we just woke up and somebody was in Washington was talking about it. You know, if was, America, was it the cash for clunkers essentially? A no, it was a ridiculous program. I mean, why not hair, haircuts for you know middle aged guys? I mean, you know, it could have been anything. No, but but and, and those cars were. I mean, you know, I, I've had car dealers tell me they wish that 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 program had never gone in in place because it was a nightmare. But but think of this: if Americans just inflated their tires to the proper level, we could save 700 million gallons uh, or barrels of oil a year, right? 700 million barrels of oil, oil imported we use 20, a year. Well, in 2005, we used 23 million a day. Yeah, over the course of a year, we could save 700 million. That's a lot. That is a lot. I, but there are I, I, all I kinds doubt of things. I mean, that's, that's too much. That's the official number of, of the... Uh, Gallons, the, the, maybe. I don't know. No, no, no. I think it's, uh, I think it's barrels. We'll, okay. we'll double check. Right, okay. okay. Long and short of it, yeah. it it's we a lot save. of oil. Yeah. Okay. But there are lots of things that we can be doing, and nobody's talking about it. We need to be spending a lot more time talking about it. Right. In the medium term, we need to start doing a lot of other things that we're not doing. We need, going back to infrastructure... We need to be improving our grid. You know, you, you mentioned President Eisenhower. Well, uh, our grid, our electric grid, by which we pass electricity around the country or regionally around the country, okay, uh, is today the equivalent of what the roads were before Eisenhower's, uh, you know, highway uh, uh, program mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. okay? It's, it's an anachronism. So we need to improve that. We need to be putting in place a smart grid, which we don't have in place. We need to be doing that. Sounds like Keynesian pol uh, policy. No, because it's an investment in America. Again, remember, the biggest bang for the buck comes from infrastructure. Right. And, and, and very few economists, if any, will, will disagree with that. Cool. So, no, we have such common – I think we, they've been – that's how Obama got elected, by these obviously common-sense approaches that you're talking about and still 
Nothing's going on. Let's talk about... Uh, uh, I think he's, he's captive of the Congress. Let's talk about Shea Porter. She promised the country that she would be... Or she promised the state of New Hampshire she would be getting every our, our boys out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, well, How many, still there. Where, but has she taken votes that have enabled uh, that have that have kept those boys over in Afghanistan? You, you know that the, there's a serious problem uh, in in America, and it's called the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, I, I don't think anybody doubts, but that the U.S. House of Representatives is the broken branch of government. Oh, I thought it was the six health care uh, lobbies for each one of them. <laughs> well. It is the broken branch of government, and we seem to have this populist notion that we can send anybody there or regardless. Somebody, right. Well, no, no, we keep doing this over and over. You know, Ronald Reagan used to warn us about the folly of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And yet, you know, we're human. We do this in our lives, and we do it in big things and small things, and God knows we do it in politics. So what do we do? We have this populist notion that you can send anybody down there. And so what we end up doing is we send people down there who have no qualifications whatsoever. And Carol Shea Porter is an excellent example, but there are other people, right? And we see this over and over again. So they get down there and they have no knowledge base of their own. They have no experience or expertise to fall back on. And so what happens is as soon as they get there, they become captive of the party line and they become captive of the special interests. And Carol Shea Porter is a perfect example of that. Here's a lady who said on the record last year, I don't need to think about the issues. All I need to do is vote with Nancy Pelosi because Nancy is always right. And sure enough, that's exactly what she's done. But she's symptomatic of, 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 of a core problem. And what I keep saying is I'm running because my life's experience has given me deep, <coughs> lifelong experience in the three core issues that will dominate the national agenda uh, for the next five or ten years. And I believe that I have the background, the experience, and the expertise not only to, you know, when I see dumb ideas, from the Democrats or the Republicans say, wait a minute, I, you know, this doesn't make any sense. And because I'm not a career politician, I don't want to be a career politician, I've never wanted to be a career politician, I'm term limited by nature, right? So I have the ability to say, no, I don't want to go down that road. And what are they going to do? Not give me a bigger office? Well, great. I've had a big office. Thank you very much. I don't mm -hmm. need it. Mm -hmm. So you're elected. What are you going to do for Manchester? And how will we know that you've done it? Well, uh, another part of the reason why I'm running is because I think we need people with private sector experience to be uh, in Washington, and, and I mean, you know, I can, I can see, you know, 77% of the Congress, I believe the figure is, are lawyers. You look at Obama, uh, he has no private sector experience. Uh, Tim Geithner doesn't, Secretary of Commerce doesn't. They need private sector experience. That reflects and I, the demographic of Manchester. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's, here's why I think business is experience, yeah. experience is important, because, you, you know, you, you know how to balance budgets, you know how to create jobs, et cetera. And I believe that I can take my business experience and help bring jobs to New Hampshire. New Hampshire does a terrible job of importing jobs into the state. I wrote an article. It's on my website, bobbastani.com. Okay. Um, and the title of it is Let's Import Jobs in, into, uh, into New Hampshire. If you go to the website of states like Georgia or Texas or South Carolina, they're proud of they boast about right off the top mm -hmm. how many companies they've brought how many when's the last time you heard of a company being brought to new hampshire to create jobs here we've got two departments uh in 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 concord part of the state government mm -hmm. okay uh and and you'll love the marketing acumen of this okay the first one is called dread department of economic resources what marketing genius thought that up yeah right okay uh and and dread within dread there's another department, the Department of Economic uh, Development, otherwise known as DEAD. Now, come on. I mean, seriously, does not, that, doesn't that speak volumes of the, you know, the acumen? But on top of that, they've just slashed their budget. The budget of DEAD and DREAD, have, so they're emasculated. There's no way they can be going out and bringing companies to New Hampshire. New Hampshire is by far the best state to operate in. 
notwithstanding the legislators' efforts to, you know, uh, to, uh, to, to make it harder and harder to run a business in New Hampshire. But it's still a great state. We ought to be out there promoting it and bringing companies in there. And it, though it's not the traditional role of a congressman, I would love nothing more than to be a spokesman for the state and, and go around and say, you've got to come to New who, Hampshire. Who are you taking money from? You're taking money from PACs? You're taking nope. money from – really? So if, if Joe Briggs knocks on your door – and there's some guy from APAC right next to me. Which one are you going to talk to? I, I'll talk to both of them, but I don't, you know, I'm not taking money from PACs. I, I've, I've got num- uh, money coming in from all over the Are district. you taking out of state money? Yeah, sure. sure. I have friends uh, around the country uh, who have been donating to Individuals my or, or organizations? Uh, individuals. I don't think. I don't think one organization. Uh, I've not knocked on anybody on one organization's door and gotten money from them. But I can tell you, I've I've got small checks. My, uh, you know, I, I've I've got a neighbor who's given me ten bucks. Uh, I've okay. got you know to 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 larger checks. And I'm telling you, I'm I'm very proud of the fact. You know, who, who just recently contributed to my campaign was Gordon Moore, uh, the the founder of Intel. Yeah. And the uh, the architect of or the author of Moore's Law, I'm very proud of that. Oh yeah, yeah. Paul McAvoy, yeah. who was the the chairman of yeah. the Council of Economic Advisors uh, in Washington at the White House, we, contributed to my. It's program. been a fast hour. We're right out of time. Take 15 seconds. Wrap it up. We got to close. Okay. Unfortunately, it's been. We would have liked to have given you more time, but you were. I think you may be too smart for the job, and I think it's going to hurt you. The, the problem when we send people to Washington who don't have a background in the issues is they quickly become captives of Washington and the special interests, and they instantly become Washington's representative to the state. I don't want to be Washington's representative to New Hampshire. I want to be your representative to Washington, and I want to make it stick, and I believe I have the background and the backbone to make that happen. Bob Bastani, bobbastani.com. Thanks so much for being here. We Thank wish you. you the very best of luck. We'll see you next time. Bring the you camera will, over you to my will, friend you, Joe. You will be back many times between yeah. now and next November, uh, September when the primary is, so don't worry, Bob. You're going to have plenty of time to take more questions as the political season heats up. Remember, folks, next week, best of the two Joes live show for Thanksgiving Eve, and then we'll be back, of course, the week after with our regular show. Please stay tuned. Keep an eye on what's going on, and uh, everybody have a very safe Happy holiday Thanksgiving. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much to all our guests tonight. It's been a great evening. If you really care about what's going on, this is the place to watch. We'll see you next week, uh, two weeks from now.